Good morning to you all. Please will you turn in God's Word to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, as we continue in that same chapter and look at verses 9 to 11. There is a little bit of an echo at the moment that's just uh, coming through on this side. And uh, just while we're getting to the right part of Scripture, I just want to mention uh, that it was actually Psalm 103 that um, we were going through last night in our time of family worship and devotion. And we were greatly encouraged by it then, and we uh, doubly so now, because whenever the Lord repeats these things, it's usually with a good purpose. And the thing that was standing out for us was His steadfast love, and how that never changes, and it's always resting upon uh, those who fear Him. It's three times in that passage it says, His steadfast love is for those who fear Him. And so... Uh, what an encouragement we have to, to have reverence for our God and a holy fear and the knowledge that he, His love is fixed firmly upon us. Revelation 6 verse 9. Read as follows. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Let's bow it. Our Father in heaven, we know that all through the history of the church, indeed all through the Scripture's record of your dealings with your people, that your servants have suffered for the sake of righteousness. We know, Lord, that our own inconveniences in this day and age as a church are so incomparably small compared to those that have gone before us. So we would ask that you would help us not to grumble for the many graces that we have already received. We do pray, Lord, that we would be mindful of your steadfast love as exhibited even in this passage upon those whom have, who have died uh, for the word of God and the, the witness that they bore. And give us insight into understanding it now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ten years after the death of Saul, a pagan Roman historian by the name of Tacitus wrote a book called The Annals. It was a history of the Roman Empire from the year AD 14 to the year AD 68 and included a record of the great fire of Rome in AD 64, the same fire that was rumored to have been started by the deranged Emperor Nero and for which Christians were ultimately blamed. Tacitus wrote as follows. It, that is the fire, it had its beginning in that part of the circus which adjoins the Palatine and the Celian hills, where amid the shops containing inflammable wares, the inferno broke out and instantly became so fierce and so rapid from the wind that it seized and its grasp the entire length of the circus. The blurry ran and first through the, le the level portions of the city, then rising to the hills, while it again devastated every place below them. It outstripped all preventative measures. Nero at this time was at Antium and did not return to Rome until the fire approached his house. It could not, however, be stopped from devouring the palace, the house, and everything around it. At last, after five days, an end was put to the conflagration. But before people had laid aside their fears, the flames returned with no less fury the second time. The temples of the gods, the porticos which had been devoted to enjoyment, fell in yet more widespread ruin. And to this fire 
there attached the greater infamy, it seemed that Nero was aiming at the glory of founding a new city and calling it by his name. All human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the, the sinister belief that the firestorm was the result of an order. Consequently, to get rid of this report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our governors, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty, that is, to being a Christian. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of their hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burned to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle, and was a show in the circus where he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a, on a cart. Hence, even for criminals who deserve extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. If you have not done so before, I would like to encourage you to read of the sufferings of your brothers and your sisters throughout the centuries of the church. Many of them are available full and in free online. Read Eusebius. Book 5, chapter 1, the detailed account of the legally sanctioned and publicly exhibited torture of Christians in southern France in the second century. Read their names, Vettius, Sanctus, Attalus, Blandina, Ponthinus, Alexander, Ponticus, a boy of 15 years old, the horrific suffering they endured. In fact, the amphitheater in which they were tormented still stands to this day. You can see a 3D panorama of it on Google Maps with children playing and a man standing on the monument talking on his cell phone. Read Fox's Books of Martyrs, especially his accounts of the demonic work of the bloody Queen Mary in Reformation England. There are a stone mosque embedded in the pavements in the very place of the martyrs burning, now routinely cruised over by teenagers on their skateboards. Read Men of the Covenant by Alexander Smelly, accounting the brutal persecution of the church by the state-sanctioned church in Scotland, the overriding ethos being frighteningly similar to communist countries today, and perhaps the desire in our own nation to regulate religion. You can worship Jesus, just make sure you do it the way the authorities tell you. There are so many examples in history. Wherever the gospel has reached, there has been this beastly backlash against the light and the freedom that it gives. Believers have paid with their very lives. Yet despite all efforts to stamp out Christianity, ancient or modern or current, the cause of Jesus Christ has endured and prevailed. As one early church theologian said so well, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more you spill it, the more it grows. And it is to this very subject that the revelation now turns as the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, breaks open the fifth seal. To recap, 
the scroll in his hand is the one he received at his coronation after his ascension to the right hand of God, and it represents the sovereign decrees and purposes of God for all of human history. So far, he's broken open the first four seals. We've seen what each one was accompanied by. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are unleashed. They are let slip upon the earth. And in their capacity as agents of God's judgment, they cause havoc throughout history. It's not what takes place at the final judgment. That only takes place at the opening of the sixth seal. No, the, 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 nor are these four horsemen um, actively engaged only a few years before the return of Christ. Rather, they ride throughout this period between the first and second comings, and that period the Bible calls the last days. This was the consequence of Christ's inaugurated rule, the result of him being qualified to take that scroll by virtue of his bloody death on the cross as the lamb and his subsequent victory through the resurre resurrection. But to pose a question now, where then does this fifth seal fit into the picture? Is this a record of a, a once-off event in the past around the time that John wrote the book of Revelation? Or is this an account of the attitude of the martyrs just before the Lord's return, in which case, you know, what, what took them so long to ask the question at all? Or is this happening a lot, repeatedly, with the martyrs continually asking the Lord uh, and being told then to rest, and then sort of working themselves up again in a state of frustration and asking again? Or... Are we doing the revelation and ourselves a disfavor, a disservice by asking the wrong question? And I think we are. I had planned this week to begin my message by addressing this very problem, and I saw in my research that others have done exactly the same, perhaps because we all anticipated the same question. One of the problems that with our generation is that when we approach the book of Revelation, we're always asking, when? 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 As if that was its purpose to tell us when to satisfy our end times curiosity. But though when is a normal question and it's an understandable question and it's even one that we are sometimes in some measure at some level able to answer, we must recognize that the great burden of this book is not ever when which at the end of the day is not going to help you. In fact, God even deflects that question in verse 10 later. He doesn't tell them when because they don't need to know. No, the great burden of the book of Revelation is what and why. Why the delay in his return? What is the reason for what we see in history? And what is the response of the church? If we shift its message to the question of when, we end up making the revelation a, a puzzle book, a detective mystery, a code to be deciphered, a choose-your-own-adventure, because everyone will arrive at different conclusions, which is what accounts for a huge proportion of the teaching around this book. But Jesus has categorically stated that no one knows when, and that when, when actually happens, it will be unexpected. It will not be part of some global countdown live streamed by the church as we await the second coming. What's more, to ask for or assign dates to an apocalyptic book full of symbolism and numbers and, and, numbers and cycles uh, that repeat the same content and different visions, well, that, that's just asking for trouble. It's, it's why 20 centuries of Christians have repeatedly got it wrong whenever they've tried and, and brought shame upon the witness of the church. So let's not concern ourselves with when this fifth seal is being opened because we're not told and it doesn't really matter despite our nice linear chronological western desire to have a date. What matters is what the vision is seeking to convey and why. And we're going to explore it under three headings. Firstly, the violent death that may accompany gospel witness, verse 9. See, John's vision now has a new element inserted into it, that of an altar, which of course adds something of a, a temple theme to this heavenly courtroom and throne room. Altars serve only one purpose. They are therefore 
sacrifice such as requires death and blood. And John sees something under this altar, this altar which evokes thoughts of the altar, the tabernacle, and the temple, and the Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, and Exodus, and so on. He sees under the altar souls, human souls, the you part of you, the part of you that makes you distinctly you and not a clone of someone else, the part of you that endures when your physical body is dead and buried or cremated. Now, stop right here and just ask yourself the question again, if this is meant to be taken in absolute literal terms, is there really a physical altar in heaven under which are millions of ethereal, ghost-like, semi-translucent, humanoid shapes that we might imagine a soul to be? For that matter, what does a soul look like? Or should we ask, how much, how much volume do they take up? How, uh, and how much do they weigh? Like, like that unhelpful email that went around about the, the mass of a human body before and after death, as if that would give us the answer about how much a soul weighs. What's more, do they intermingle and flow with one another? You know, can, can, they, can more than one soul occupy the same space? Does, does this mean that the Christians in heaven are locked down under a giant altar or that they're miniaturized under a small standard sized one? No, no, of course not. This, this is all symbolism as we come to expect in the book of Revelation. And the point here is made plain by both the picture and the explanation that follows. Picture an altar, the place of death and sacrifice, the place of atonement, the covering of sin, and under it, where ordinarily the blood would sort of pool after the sacrifice, where it would run down, having been sprinkled against the sides, under it are the souls of martyred, departed Christians. Explanation, well, implied perhaps is that they are covered by the blood of the Lamb, hence they place under the altar. But far more explicitly in this context is what comes out from the rest of the verse. The emphasis is not on their being under the blood of the Lamb at this point, but on them having shed their blood as a consequence of faithfulness to the Lamb. Their death, them being slain, the altar, therefore, is seen as the place of bloody martyrdom. In fact, the word witness there is even the word from which we get the word martyr, uh, martyrian in this case. What, what, why then an altar? Uh, because their deaths are seen by God as a sacrifice. No, not a sacrifice for sin, understand, no one is saved by self-sacrifice. No amount of self-harm or self-cutting or self-punishment or self-flagellation or selfless dying is ever going to pay for one human sin. The only sacrifice for sin is the once made and perfect and complete sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross that some 2,000 years ago. Now, this sacrifice here is what happens when identification with Jesus Christ proves so costly that you are actually killed as a consequence thereof. Shot, stabbed, beaten, burned, stoned, drowned, crushed, torn apart by wild beasts. In fact, the word used here to describe their deaths, slain, is the same word used to describe the brutal death of the Lamb in chapter 5, verse 7. It was bloody. And such faithfulness in God's cause does not go unnoticed by Him. To use the language of the Old Testament, He counts every drop of martyr's blood as a precious free will offering, something he delights in. And there have been many, scores, hundreds of thousands more martyrdoms in the last 150 years of the church than in the first 18 centuries of the church put together. I mean, you, you know this, right? You know that what you believe is not universally 
historically or presently popular. Quite the reverse. The world will often bear a violent hatred towards those who steadfastly and publicly identify as distinctly Christian. Uh, because that's what it comes down to in verse 9 here. They are slain because of God's authoritative word, the absolute truth of Scripture, and their spoken conviction that it is so. Their testimony, the witness they bore about that word. And, and this may be a difficult pill for us to swallow as we go into a world that no longer even pretends to be Christian. And of course, none of us want to be hated. We, we all instinctively, we want to be liked. We, we want to be accepted. That, that's that's, that's my, my gut impulse, isn't it yours? You, you want people to accept you. But to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ guarantees some sort of hostility. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The only way to avoid it is not to be seen to be a Christian or not to live godly. But if you say with 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 there is one God and with John 14 verse 6 that Jesus is the way, the, the mediator to that one God and apart from Jesus Christ no one will come to God. If you say with John 3 verse 18, that to believe in Jesus is to be saved and not to believe is to be condemned already? If you say with Revelation 20 verse 15, that it warns that those whose names are not found in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire, if you say any of this, the most basic elemental parts of your faith, at best, at best, the world will respond with indifference and say, whatever, I don't believe that. But far more likely and increasingly so in our time, it will respond with indignation, with outrage, with accusation and ultimatums. Many will not tolerate us to believe and bear witness to the word of God. They might even try to kill you. You say, well, this is not something that is immediately pressing upon us in Cape Town, South Africa. We have the Constitution. We have the international press. We have the United Nations a Human Rights Manifesto. There's, there's not going to be a violent martyrdom upon the horizon. How do you know? How, how do you know? Oftentimes, nations have been caught unawares by the speed at which a so-called civilized society can descend into all manner of depravity and bay, cry out, bark and howl like dogs after the blood of those that will not conform. It's happening in the world right now. Not to this degree, thankfully, but there is a demand for wholehearted agreement with various movements of any kind. You take your pick. There's so many that are going on. And the consequence of disagreement or reservation or hesitation or qualification of any kind on your part will be anger, isolation, economic punishment, public shaming, and perhaps even civil liabilities in the civilized world. And it would take but the slightest shift in direction for all of that animosity and hatred to fall upon Christians again. And who knows what might then follow. And even if actual martyrdom is not on the table, and probably it's not, and I am not saying it's not happening in some parts of the world, it is, certainly. But even if for us it is not actual literal blood, don't say to yourself, I will probably never have to sacrifice on the altar much as a consequence of my faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, you will. Every single day. You will have to die 
to your inclination to love only those who love you and start to love others and give them the gospel that can save their souls. You will have to die to your impulse to always have the last word or be seen to be right and learn to be silent and forgiving. You will have to die to your love of praise and eagerness to be well liked and seek the pleasure of God instead. You will have to die to the pride that prevents you from putting what is right, what, putting right what is so obviously wrong in your marriage or your family. You will have to die to the cowardly impulse that seeks to hide your identification of, with Jesus Christ for fear of being thought strange. Others may or may not deal violently with you, but make no mistake, you are called to deal violently with yourself. To put to death what is fleshly in you, Colossians 3 verse 5. To take up your cross daily and follow Jesus, Luke 9 23. To severely discipline your body and make it your slave. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Therein lies the beginning of our Christian dying. And therein lies our actual preparation for martyrdom should it ever come. Because Romans 12, verse 1 following, we must cultivate the habit of offering our bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. We have to die to ourselves. But let's move to the second point now, verse 10, the heavenly outcry against a wicked earth. And I, I don't want to understate the intensity of this cry. Our, our English translations, they just say, cried out with a loud voice. But if you were to translate it most directly, taking into account all the various compound words, it would read as follows. Out, cry aloud or scream, voice or sound, greatly in the widest sense, saying... Of course, that would be pretty clumsy, but the overall sense of it is a deafening, collective outburst, an impassioned, most earnest plea to mighty God. They address him as sovereign Lord, the same title used by the early church in the book of Acts when they cried out for boldness in the face of the growing hostility that came from the Jewish Sanhedrin, not a quiet, reflective, conservatively dignified expression of their Calvinism, but a desperate, loud cry, Sovereign Lord, help us! That's what's going on here. And they address him as holy and true, which is also how Jesus revealed himself to the faithful church enduring persecution at Philippi in chapter 3 verse 7 of Revelation. And it becomes so integral to our understanding of this passage. God is holy and true, which means he cannot abide, he cannot tolerate, he cannot suffer indefinitely that which is not holy and not true. And you see that this becomes the basis of their appeal. They call out to one who has all power and all rights and total control over his creation. He is sovereign. They call out to one who is holy and true and who must ultimately act against evil. And they say, how long, God, will you let this injustice go on? How long will you tolerate this cruel, depraved, wicked assault upon your beloved church? How long must Christians be mobbed in the streets, chased from their jobs, cast out of their homes, hauled before the courts, condemned to die? When will you avenge as you said you would when you said vengeance is mine, says the Lord? It's an honest question, isn't it? 
It's a question that persecuted Christians are going to ask. It's one that serious-minded Christians will ask, grieved by the rampant wickedness of this world. You say, <clears throat> but it sounds a little, you know, un-Christian. It sounds a little bit unloving. It doesn't sound like Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I'm pretty sure it's not what Jesus had in mind when he said, love your enemies and pray for them who persecute you. Are the martyrs just really bitter? Were they martyred not so much for their um, faith in Jesus Christ, but, nor, but more because they were that obnoxious variety of Christians that thinks that you, you are faithful by being deliberately offensive? What sort of people are we dealing with here in Revelation 6? But that's to misunderstand both who they are and what exactly it is they are asking. Because firstly, these people are now in a state of sinless perfection. They are in heaven with the Lord. They are completely liberated and sanctified in all that they are. And therefore, they are incapable of being spiteful or bitter or mean or unforgiving. Their prayers are much purer than yours or mine. Of that I assure you. But secondly, it's, it's, to, it's to misunderstand what it is they are asking. Uh, because at the heart of this request is not a desire for personal revenge. At the heart of this request is a desire for the honor and glory of God to be upheld. They are appealing to him as a holy judge in charge of his creation. They were, after all, condemned to die by human courts. They were accused and convicted and executed. The world said that they were wrong and guilty of evil because they would not join the world in its wickedness. They would not bow the knee to Caesar. And so now they cry out to God, the ultimate judge, to act in the interest of his justice and show the truth of the matter. They know that he will eventually act against those that violate his bride and defame her character. In essence, what they are asking is simply this. Sovereign Lord, holy and true, Act according to your sovereignty, your holiness, and your truth. Because that's what you've promised to do. The only question is, how long? When? And though neither they nor we will have the answer to that question, the whole scene is profoundly useful to us. It tells us something about the saints in heaven, that is, Christians in heaven. Not that they are confined under a giant altar, but, that, but of their awareness, of their remembrance of the goings-on of earth. They, they're not in a state of soul sleep. They're not in a state of limbo. They're not in a state of otherworldly transcendental meditation. Rather, their memories, their identities have been retained. If it were not so, if they had undergone some sort of mental format, a wiping clean of every thought and experience they ever had, in what sense would they be who they were? That they wouldn't. They may as well just be brand newly created souls out of thin air. It would make no sense of the songs of redemption and salvation because they would not know what they were singing about. But it's not the case. As it is, they are here. They are appreciative as the, of their status as those who are redeemed. And they remember. You say, but if that's the case, then how could heaven be heaven? How could anyone rejoice in salvation if they remember the shame of past sin and the cancer and the car accidents and the martyrdoms and family members lost to judgment and hell and every wicked depravity upon the earth? Surely these things, the remembrance of these things would rob heaven of all of its joy? Wrong. God knows and remembers those things, yet he is not eternally miserable for knowing them. He who is perfect in love takes perfect joy in himself. And unless you are suggesting your love is greater than his, so will we when we get there. We will take perfect joy in our Creator and love him perfectly, even in the remembrance of a fallen earth. All of our remembering will be sanctified. That is, 
being holy like God is holy in character, we will finally see sin for what it is and God for who he is. And we will look back on human history, not with eternal regret and sorrow, but rather through the lens of God's sovereignty, God's glory in the grace of salvation, and God's glory in his eternal judgments, which is what they're getting at here. We won't question or doubt the fairness of any of God's dealings ever. Indeed, we will praise Him for everything that He has, is, or will do, which is why the church in heaven even sings of the wrath of God. Revelation 19. Now, I know that's probably the most outrageous thing you've ever heard if you've not heard it before, and I'm not asking you to swallow it whole. Please go home and check it out later and read about it in the Word of God. For now, keep what you've learned in your mind. While there is worldly outrage, if you so much as mention sin, there is a heavenly outcry to see it judged for the honor and the glory of God. And while a comfortable 21st century church might wrongly be disturbed by the talk of God's vengeance, the afflicted church of the first century would have received this as the Holy Spirit intended as an encouragement. So that weeping Christians watching their brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters being tortured to death by laughing crowds, would know that the sovereign, holy, and true God will most certainly uphold His justice through salvation or through vengeance. Third point. The justified faith that rests in sovereign purpose. Verse 11. Notice that the immediate response to their cry for vindication is each to be given a white robe. Now again, this is not a commentary on the fashion or textile industry of the heavenly places. When the Bible speaks of, when Revelation speaks of white robes here or chapter 3 or 4 or 7 or 19, it is not saying that for all time and eternity the singular color and dress code of the redeemed will be to wear a dull, plain, loose-fitting white robe with all else forbidden. I remind you that the tabernacle, for instance, was resplendent in color and artistry and we should not expect the new creation to somehow be less magnificent than the first. Now, the burden of this vision of the white robes is uh, given to them at this particular moment in response to this particular cry. It's to demonstrate that they are innocent. It's the, uh, 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 a symbolic way of speaking of purity and, and that their faith is legally justified in God. I'm not talking about justification by faith, at least not directly. They were already that upon the earth. After all, they were justified by faith, declared innocent, declared uh, blameless uh, because of the, the, the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross and their faith in Him. Now, what I'm talking about in this heavenly picture that combines courtroom and throne room and, and temple, in this legal appeal that they have made to God's character as the sovereign and holy judge, their case now is being upheld. They are shown to be in the right, to be innocent of the crimes of which they stand accused. And every Christian that now opens the book of Revelation can see that because they are dressed in white. The first readers of this book could see that though Antipas had died, though Stephen had been stoned, though James had been beheaded, all of them with accusations raining down by crowds and juries and prosecutors and Lord hate good of Vanity Fair, though that would have all come upon them, the greatest judge of all has clothed them in white. He has justified 
their case in the heavenly courtroom. And ca can you see what an encouragement to the church this will be, the church on earth, including us? What chiefly in history and in our day are the accusations that are labeled against the faithful followers of Jesus Christ, perhaps even causing us to, to doubt ourselves and wonder. Can, can you think of some of these accusations? Now, here's a few sort of moving generally forward throughout the ages. You Christians, you don't worship Jehovah. You worship a dead carpenter, a false messiah. You do not respect the law of God. You break up families and marriages. You, re you rebel against the state, against Caesar. You don't worship our gods. You're a cannibal because you eat the bread and drink of the cup, the body and blood of Christ. You practice incest because you call even your spouse, your brother or your sister. You're a part of some cult. You're a heretic speaking strange doctrines that do not align with centuries of tradition. You are a subversive influence agitating for trouble in an otherwise peaceful society. You are unbelievably narrow-minded to believe that old book. Yours is a Western religion for Western Europeans. You are trying to destroy our culture, our heritage. You just think you are better than everyone else. You are superstitious, unscientific sheep. You are so judgmental. You just won't fit in and go along to get along. Your views have no place in today's world. You live in the past. You bring a message of hatred. You and your kind are what's wrong with the world today. Sound familiar? So what does God do in response to the martyr's cry? What does he do to encourage us who must still live under the weight of these accusations, judicial or otherwise? He gives us a vision of the heavenly saints being justified before the highest throne in the greatest court before the judge of all the earth. But he doesn't give them or us the precise answer to their question. He doesn't tell them when. But he tells them what. And he tells them why. What must they do? Verse 11, their responsibility, not ours, theirs, is to rest a little while longer. Which probably tempts us to ask the question again, well, how long is a little while, please? And then we completely miss the point of what God is saying. God and heaven's perspective on time will prove notably different from ours. 2 Peter 3, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness. So a little while might mean more or less than we expect. The Bible frequently ter speaks in terms of the imminent coming of the Lord, the soon-to-come Lord, as it has done for centuries, and not because it is grammatically dishonest, but to impress upon us the shortness of time, all time, relative to eternity, and the urgency, there, therefore, to both repent and believe the gospel and to see others converted. But for those in heaven, the urgency has passed, and they are told to rest a little while longer. How long? Uh, don't worry about that. Just rest a little while longer. But look at what it is that will terminate their waiting and hours. Look at the why. Why does God delay his final vengeance upon the wicked and judgments upon the earth? Verse 11, they must wait until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. 
And that is very interesting because it shows you that God has a plan. It tells you that God has already appointed the end from the beginning. He has numbered how many of his servants will be martyred. He will bring his purposes to completion, it says. He is sovereign indeed. Not one drop of blood shed through the ages has ever been spilt apart from his decrees. Why? Well, why, why does he let us die? That's a whole other question. Suffice to say, now that the martyrs are not asking, why did you let us die? Their, it was for many reasons. Their testimony to a watching world, their encouragement to be faithful to other believers, to convert their persecutors in some cases, and to condemn them in others. For now, we should stick with what should stick with us is this, this hand of God controlling history, sovereign Lord, numbered martyrs, completed purpose, and then he comes. Now can you see how truly glorious this is? The great irony of history, of all worldly and satanic opposition to the gospel, is that every time a Christian is struck down in martyrdom, it brings the triumph of Christian hope closer and nearer. What a great irony that is. Every time Nero sets his dogs to tear, every time the Sanhedrin picked up stones to throw, every time Bloody Mary set her priests to burn, every time the state church has turned on the true church, every ta time Mao or Stalin or King John Un has crushed with hammer and sickle, every time ISIS has beheaded with the sword, every single time, the blood of the martyrs spoke louder than their life, and that is a victory. The soul of the martyrs ascended to their place of eternal rest, and that is a victory. And the day of Christ's return drew nearer, and that is the victory. How ironic! How wonderful! In the purposes of a sovereign God, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, the outworking of sovereign purpose for Trinitarian victory. You say, well, that sounds wonderful. Yes. Yes, it is. So are you ready to be a martyr? Are ready to spill your blood in the cause of Jesus Christ? To see his triumph, the nations converted, and his return? Or is this one of those privileges we like to read about, but rather to leave for others? Now, before you think that I am suggesting that we rush out and actively seek martyrdom the way some of those obnoxious Christians seem to do, I am not. Martyrdom is not our prerogative. Martyrdom is something that God appoints. Martyrdom is not something that we seek out. Martyrdom is something for which God gives unique grace to those that he has appointed for it. Some early Christians tried to run after martyrdom and they ended up falling away. We read about one in the letter to the church at Smyrna. In fact, you may find this amusing, but one Early Christian mother even hid the clothes of her headstrong son, Oregon, to prevent him from charging out to join others needlessly uh, to be killed for his faith. And he who thought he was bold enough to die for Christ was too embarrassed to do so without his clothes on. Thank God for wise Christian mothers. Now my point in asking the question, are you ready to be a martyr, is not to preempt a premature or uncalled for martyrdom, it is simply to ask, are you ready? If it should suddenly come upon us, as it often does, 
And how, how does the Christian ready himself or herself for persecution, martyrdom, or otherwise, keeping in mind that God gives grace for the day, that day, and not that grace that we need then now? How do we get ready? Is it by living a life that is devoted to watching Netflix, obsessing over a career, playing games, living to shop, being sports mad, a fitness fanatic, climbing the social ladder, and striving for the house with the white picket fence? Is that how we get ready for martyrdom? No. You say, okay, well then is it by not watching Netflix, having a career, playing games, shopping, sporting, gymming, socializing, or having a home? No. I enjoy some of those things as much as the next person. We're not called to the ascetic life of a monastic, a monk or nun living in somewhere in the desert or something, nor are we called, though, to a life of relentless self-satisfaction. That's my point. Here's the point. If you and I are truly to be ready for persecution when it comes, and surely it is becoming harder to be a Christian and bear witness to the, the Word of God in this world. If you and I are to have a faith that endures and does not fall away or shrink back in shame at the return of Jesus Christ, we have to cultivate true Christianity now. We have to die to ourselves now. I'll end with a quote that says it better than I could. This is how you prepare for persecution. Soak yourself in the Bible. Cling to its promises. Live in the world the Bible describes, not in the world that rebellious human beings invent for themselves. Read the Bible like you are going to be martyred for it. Pray like you would pray if they, you knew they were coming to kill you one day soon. Preach the gospel like you might be martyred for it. Cast your votes at church like your life depends on it. Love your spouse like you would if you knew that they were coming for you. Hold your kids and teach them the faith like there is no tomorrow. The truth is bloody. It is soaked in the blood of martyrs who have died in the past or are suffering somewhere right now and who will one day stand courageously and seal the confession with blood. Live like there is something worth dying for. That's how you prepare yourself for martyrdom. Put it in your mind. God, Christ, the Bible, the truths of the faith, these things are worth more than life to me. Life without these things is not worth living. I would rather have my life taken from me than surrender the good confession. God will protect and provide for my widowed wife and orphan children. He is God, not my persecutor. I love my family and will serve them as long as there's breath in my chest. But all the while I will teach in the Psalm 63 verse 6, the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. We must think about these things beyond this moment. We need to ask, what if five years from now they are going to demand I renounce my faith or die? End quote. That's how you prepare for martyrdom. Because gospel witness in this world may one day demand your life. And there is a heavenly outrage against the wickedness of this earth. But sovereign purpose will be brought to completion. Even through the blood of the martyrs. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven. It is infinitely easier to speak about these things and to have grand designs for our own living out of faith than it is to actually live through them or live by them. And so we freely confess that we are, as Psalm 103 says, of the dust of the earth, that we have far less faith than we should, 
that we are far weaker than we imagine. And we appeal to the throne of grace for strength that you would give us of your most Holy Spirit to sustain and carry us as we bear witness to the Word of God and our testimony. Help us, Father. We do pray that you would relieve the suffering of the persecuted church, that you would spare Christians from the sorrows that would come upon them. But we avail ourselves to your sovereign purpose and say, nevertheless, not our will, but your will be done. Have mercy on us, we pray, and on our families. Give us wisdom and season our words with grace. May we never suffer for wrongdoing or for evil. But if we should suffer according to your purposes, then let us rest contentedly in the goodness of our God and his steadfast love. Help us, we pray, in all these things, for your name and for your glory, we pray. Amen. Now, we are able this morning to play and stream a song. We are not yet permitted to sing along, but you perhaps would silently like to speak or mouth the words or hum along. But it is a song that reflects our safe position, our strength in and through our Lord. Could we play that song, please? Good morning, boys.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.